Well, we'll start this morning with some ex- excerpts from an article published on December 22, 2003 in Newsweek magazine. As usual, I've, I've edited it, cut and pasted for the so- sake of time. The article is entitled, Iraqi Vice. Quote, Before the invasion, Iraq was one of the world's most tightly controlled societies. A committee in the Ministry of Culture kept a strict watch against even mildly naughty movies, magazines, and films. Now Iraqis are making up for what they've missed. And many other Iraqis, young and old, are blaming America. Some people say the spread of such things is designed to weaken our society, says Colonel Daoud Salman, a police chief in one of Baghdad's roughest districts. Every day we hear it from people on the street, not just the religious people, but ordinary ones too. Iraqis call it the bad side of freedom. What bothers many Iraqis, apparently even some of those who make their living from the sin industry, is the question of where Iraq is headed. Down the street from the market are adult cinemas, where 70 cents buys an all-day ticket, and the audience hoots in protest if a non-filthy trailer interrupts the action. We have to compete with the satellites, says the manager of one theater, almost apologetically. A third of the country's population is estimated to have access to filthy TV channels via satellite dish. For those who don't, enterprising dealers record the footage on video discs and sell them for a pittance. Under Saddam, this would have been an automatic six months in jail, says a vendor who keeps ultra-filthy wares in a drawer for special customers at his video shop in Baghdad's Karata district. Now, nothing will happen to us. One young man says it's a big improvement from Saddam Hussein's day. Back then, he says, the only establishment for a poor boy like himself was at a gypsy settlement on the capital's western outskirts. But now there are plenty of places. He grins. Now we have freedom. The regime's vice laws remain on the books, but they're rarely enforced. Immediately after the war, we started raids and arresting promoters and purveyors says Lieutenant Colonel Omar Zaid, a top Iraqi cop. But the American MPs made us release them. After that, the promoters and purveyors understood they had nothing to fear. Most Iraqis say they don't know what to do about the vice explosion. Close quotes. Okay, let's just pause for a few moments and ask ourselves a few questions. Under Saddam, this type of material was not available. But under American occupation, it immediately became available. Isn't the name of this war Operation Iraqi Freedom? Does freedom mean having essentially unlimited access to the most vile kinds of filth? Is that freedom? Is being basted in filth one of the hallmarks of a free society? Is that police chief Wright, who said some people say the spread of such things is designed to weaken our society. Can the spread of filth weaken a society? Could that have anything to do with it? And as painful as it might be to ask ourselves this question, is it possible that this was deliberate? After all, why would our MPs, our American military police, prevent the Iraqi police, for enforcing vice laws? Why would our military police protect the purveyors, promoters, and peddlers of degenerate filth? 
Now hold those thoughts. And let's move from December 2003 back to March of 2002. We'll read a few excerpts from a speech by Dr. E. Michael Jones. Quote, At 4.30 p.m. on March 30th, 2002, Israeli military forces occupied the city of Ramallah in the West Bank. Now, for the younger people here, the West Bank is territory that was seized by Israel in 1967. They occupied East Jerusalem over to where the current border is with Jordan right now. It goes a ways up from there and all the way down to the Dead Sea. That's the West Bank. There are about 2 million Palestinians who live in the West Bank. As of right now, today, only about 8% of them are Christian, and they get mistreated by both sides. Bethlehem is in the West Bank, just to give you a picture, Bethlehem. Okay, so at 4.30 p.m. on March 30th, 2002, Israeli military forces occupied the city of Ramallah in the West Bank and seized three of the four Palestinian TV stations broadcasting in the area. According to a report from the Advertiser, it's an Australian newspaper, the Israelis began broadcasting filth, and I mean the worst kind of filth, over the El Watan, the Amawaj, and the Al Sharak channels. The only Palestinian station not taken over by the Israelis ran a written message on the bottom of its screen stating that, quote, anything currently shown on El Watan and other local TV channels has nothing to do with Palestinian programs but is being broadcast by the Israeli occupation forces. Close quote. The situation in Ramallah was made much worse by the fact that the Israelis had imposed a curfew enforced by snipers stationed on tall buildings, like the local hospital, forcing people to stay indoors, where naturally enough, anyone seeking further information about the occupation would turn to the local TV stations. Close quote. Okay. Let's just pause for a minute, make sure we see what's going on here. We just got done hearing about how this kind of filth suddenly became available in Iraq after the American invasion and how the American military police actively prevented the Iraqi police from enforcing vice laws. But in this case, we have the Israeli military imposing a curfew on the Palestinians and at the same time actually broadcasting this kind of filth over the local TV stations. So let's ask ourselves another question. Why on earth would the Israeli military put the Palestinian people under curfew and then deliberately broadcast hardcore filth over the Palestinian TV stations. As one Palestinian woman wondered, why on earth should one do such a thing? Why? Why? Dr. Jones. Now listen to this. Three months earlier, three months earlier, three months earlier on January 12, 2002, the Islamic Association for Palestine news agency ran an article claiming that, quote, representatives of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and Israeli Shin Beth experts, Parenthetical remark, the Shin Beth is the arm of the Israeli government responsible for security within Israel and its occupied territories. Okay, so three months before the Israeli military put Ramallah under curfew and began broadcasting the absolute worst kind of filth over the TV stations, three months before, on January 12, 2002, the Islamic Association for Palestine News Agency ran an article claiming that, quote, representatives of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and Israeli Shin Beth experts have recommended that the relatively conservative Palestinian society be flooded with filth, drugs, and gambling. In order to keep Palestinian youth away from joining the resistance against Israeli occupation and apartheid, close quote. The idea, according to the IAP report, 
quote, first came from the Israeli side, who suggested that only these things could take Palestinian youths away from their hostile fixation on Israel, close quote. Okay, so let's walk back through this real quick. In January of 2002, the Islamic Association for Palestine News Agency reports that experts from the CIA and the Shin Beth are recommending that the relatively conservative Palestinian society be flooded with filth, with drugs, and with gambling in order to keep Palestinian youths from joining the resistance against Israeli occupation and apartheid. Then a few months later, in March 2002, the Israeli military does just that. It occupies Ramallah, puts the city under curfew, and begins broadcasting the absolute worst kind of filth over the TV stations. And all that certainly puts the situation in Iraq in 2003 into much clearer focus. Back to Dr. Jones. During the summer of 2002, former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu arrived in America to promote the American invasion of Iraq, but he also advocated American involvement in the use of suggestive or explicit TV programming as a way of subverting the morals of the Islamic world. According to a UPI story filed on September 12, 2002, quote, a former Israeli prime minister called upon the United States to effect regime change in both Iraq and Iran, prescribing a military invasion to topple the government in Baghdad, the transmission of ribald television programming via satellite into Persia, where he said the influx of pop culture would prove, quote, subversive, close quote, to the conservative Islamic regime. Citing the hundreds of thousands of satellite television dishes in Iran, Benjamin Netanyahu told the House Government Reform Committee that the United States could incite a revolution through the use of such Fox broadcasting staples as Melrose Place and Beverly Hills 90210, both of which feature beautiful young people in varying states of undress, delivering glamorous, materialistic lives and engaging in promiscuity. Netanyahu told the committee, quote, this is pretty subversive stuff. Close quotes. What are we talking about here? Experts from the Shin Beth and CIA recommend relatively conservative Palestinian society be flooded with filth, with drugs, and with gambling in order to keep the Palestinian youth from joining resistance against Israeli occupation and apartheid. Some months later, we see a concrete example of this when they seize Palestinian TV stations, put that area under curfew, and begin broadcasting filth. Some months after that, the House hears testimony from the former Prime Minister of Israel who advocates transmitting provocative or explicit television programs via satellite into Iran because the influx of pop culture would prove uh, subversive to the conservative regime. He explicitly states that the United States could incite a revolution by using shows from network TV, which he considers to be so subversive they could incite a revolution. He cites Melrose Place and Beverly Hills 90210. He explains that the reason these shows are so subversive as they feature beautiful young people in varying states of undress, living glamorous, materialistic lives, and engaging in promiscuous behavior. Following the invasion of Iraq, we see that the filth immediately becomes available there, and the American military police actually prevented the Iraqi police from enforcing vice laws and curtailing the flood of filth in Iraqi society. So what are we talking about here? We are talking about psychological Warfare. We are talking about psychological warfare of the most wicked kind. It is so wicked, in fact, there's only one category could possibly put in, and that is diabolical. And I'm not exaggerating. This sin actually has a name. It's called diabolic scandal. Because the one who commits this sin are actually attacking their brothers in the same way that we are attacked by devils. 
We are talking about the deliberate and diabolical military use of filth to demoralize and disrupt a conservative and relatively stable society. We're talking about tactics appropriate for the armies of the Antichrist. That's what we're talking about. But of course, Padre, we're only talking about Islamic societies, right? Sure, you don't reckon anyone, anywhere, would ever dream of using these techniques against a relatively conservative Christian society anywhere, do you? It's tempting, real tempting to just end the sermon there and let everybody ponder that. And everyone here ought to ponder you got to spend some serious time thinking about that and looking around. But since our country is basted in this filth 24-7, I won't end there. I think a few more remarks of practical nature are in order. Television. We need to wake up and recognize what is going on here. We just heard that standard Fox network TV programs from over a decade ago were considered to be so subversive as to be able to incite a revolution in a relatively conservative society. We need to think and really think about our TV use. If someone here is using their TV as a screen for watching quality videos or checking on tornado warnings or what have you, that's fine, fair enough. But if anyone here is using their TV to view things, the kind of programming that the Prime Minister of Israel suggests our government use for purposes of psychological warfare, that is to say, if your TV viewing includes scenes of beautiful young people in varying states of undress, living glamorous, materialistic lives and engaging in promiscuous behavior, and we're not simply talking about programs, we're talking about advertisements, If this is what we are using our TV to view, then we are putting ourselves in grave danger of having our morals subverted. You need to fix your TV. Fix it. 10 gauge, 12 gauge, 410, rock, I don't care, but fix that thing. There's a good rule of thumb If you wouldn't show it to the Blessed Virgin, then what in the heck are you doing watching it? Because she's there. Fix that TV. Filters. There are are two handouts out there on that table. One's on filters. Get a filter on every computer, on every tablet, and on every smartphone. Frankly, I'm of the mind that you should get phones with no internet access so you get them blocked as part of your plan. Uh, there's ones, the rabbis over here have something called kosher phones. It's a great idea where it's just a phone. How's that for an idea? So it's not a, a, a movable anything else. It's great. Or you can get it blocked as part of your plan. Okay? This little handout has some varying options for filters and accountability where some of which are free. The woman of the house should have the password. Get a filter on every computer, every tablet, every smartphone, and the woman in the house should have the password. Now, mothers, I want to say something, and it is important that you listen. Please do not assume that your little Johnny wouldn't ever, ever get in trouble. Your little Johnny is a boy. Trust the priest on this. Over the years, I've been saying this over and over and over again. You can't believe how many times a crying mother shows up telling me that even though she heard the priest say umpteen gazillion times, she just knew that her little Johnny wouldn't get into that trouble, and then she finds out that her little Johnny is in that kind of trouble, and it's like Humpty Dumpty, just shattered, innocence gone. Get the thing on there. Parents make excuse after excuse, and there their children are in bondage, falling into hell. Without explaining details, everybody here needs to understand another point. A significant percentage of this kind of material 
has specific demons associated on it because there's a part that they don't film. There's a whole part of this industry, and don't research this because we've got enough work to do, there's a part of this industry where they actually have ceremonies beforehand that they don't film, where they're invoking the particular demons deliberately. Then they film the other part, and the whole object of the ceremonies beforehand is so anybody that willingly watches it by that very fat opens the door and invites that demon to come in and have dominion over him. And the demon will honor that request and come into that viewer's life, and it's his own fault. And guess what? Those kind of websites don't have a little flashy warning. Other ceremonies not filmed. Warning. You can get spirits of fornication in your life. Get a filter on every computer, every tablet, and every smartphone. Exorcists have to deal with this. It's a blooming tidal wave because of this kind of stuff. When we get a call to go bless a house and there's weird things going on, there's three things you assume. A, they have the Internet. B, they have the Internet. And three, they have the Internet. That's the three things. And you go over there and you just ask them a question like this, sort of third-person subjunctive. You know, if I had been standing around looking at all the things that you might have looked at on the computer, would there be anything that might bother me? And they'll all go, yeah, we're okay, you know. So at least that narrows it down to what we're blessing against, you know. Hello, the devil is real. Don't mess with this stuff. So there's all kinds of other reasons, but there's another one people have. Okay, enough on that. Get a filter on. Next, put the computer in a public place not in a private room, and make darn sure it's situated so the screen can be easily seen. And I'd even suggest having big mirrors behind it so the screen can be seen from every angle in the room. Keep it in a public place, get the filter on, the woman of the house should have the password, and the Internet should be shut off and all the smartphones locked up before bedtime every night. No exceptions. Parents make excuse after excuse, and their kids are in bondage and falling into hell. Okay, now let's get really practical. It's a quick review to make sure everyone here knows exactly how to deal with these kind of temptations. We'll start with the Holy Scriptures. I'm going to read something from Holy Job. Job, chapter 31 and verse 1. This is St. Job. I'm quoting him. I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not so much as think upon a virgin. He made a covenant with his eyes, not that he wouldn't look. No, it's more than that, that he won't even think. So it isn't just the eyes of his head, it's the eyes of his mind. That's how a saint acts. Now guess what? Naturally speaking, that's not possible. And we're living in a brothel, and barring direct divine intervention, it's not going to get any better. It's just going to get worse. So we have to know, how can we have this covenant with our eyes? What can we do to keep a covenant with our eyes so that we don't even think on these kind of topics? So let's make sure we understand the exact moral principle at stake, and then we'll go through the practical issue on that. Okay, this is the basic moral principle that applies to all questions of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. All pleasure outside of marriage. So that includes people that are married, but somebody they're thinking, if they're thinking about something they're not married to, it's not, it, not if they're, they're married to them, you're good to go. Okay. All pleasure outside of marriage that is associated with the creative power that is directly willed or desired, intentionally procured or permitted, is a mortal sin. I'll run that down again. All pleasure outside of marriage that is associated with the creative power that is directly willed or desired, intentionally procured or permitted, is a mortal sin. Therefore, it is mortally sinful for the unmarried to think, say, or do anything with the intention of arousing even the smallest degree of this type of sensual pleasure. I'll run through that all one more time, and then we'll talk about how it works. All pleasure outside of marriage that is associated with the creative power that is directly willed or desired, intentionally procured or permitted, is a mortal sin. Therefore, it is mortally sinful for the unmarried to think, 
say, or do anything with the intention of arousing even the smallest degree of this type of sensual pleasure. If this pleasure has arisen and there was no intention, the image suddenly pops into our mind's eye, or we unsuspectingly walk around a corner, or we're confronted with something that's very immoral in that sense. So there's no intention, and there's no consent. Hey, I don't want to see that. There's no sin. No intention, no consent, no sin. If the pleasure has arisen and there was no intention, but but there's some consent, we toy with it for a while before we fully, without fully giving ourselves over to it. That's a venial sin. If the pleasure is risen and there's no intention, but there's full consent, hey, check that out. That's a mortal sin. If there's direct intention, I'm going to pick up that magazine and start leafing through it. I am going to go to those websites. That's a mortal sin. So no intention, no consent, no sin. You could be fighting for hours. It's no sin. No intention, no consent, no sin. No intention, some consent, venial sin. No intention, full consent, mortal sin. Direct intention, mortal sin. One more time. No intention, no consent, no sin. No intention, some consent, venial sin. No intention, full consent, mortal sin. Direct intention, Mortal sin. So what do we do to protect ourselves? Because we're going to have to protect ourselves. Because we're not going to be protected by our government. Saints teach we have to be watchful for and flee from occasions of these types of sins. That means we have to avoid bad websites. We have to avoid bad television. We have to avoid bad movies. We have to avoid bad magazines. We have to avoid bad music. And most importantly, we have to avoid bad company. No one goes to heaven alone, and no one goes to hell alone. It's important. We should make good confessions regularly. St. Philip Neri, great saint, apostle of Rome, if somebody was struggling, he'd have them come to confession every day if they were struggling with purity. So we have to go on a regular basis, weekly or more often. The idea with confession is you go to confession before you need to go to confession so you don't need to go to confession. That sounds ironic, but that's how you want to do it. So you're always good to go because we don't know when we're going to die and we want to be in the right position to meet our maker. Okay. We need to make fervent holy communions. We beg God for the grace to remain pure, to remain holy. So that's a sacramental thing. Frequent confession, fervent communions, and a good thanksgiving afterwards. We're really asking the Lord for everything we need. That's sacramentally. Prayer-wise, there's two essential elements to that. They both have to do with Our Lady. If you want to be pure, you've got to go to Our Lady. What kind of prayers do we have to do? We need to say the three Hail Marys when we wake up and we go to bed. Three Hail Marys for holiness and purity when we wake up. Three Hail Marys before we go to bed. That is very easy. I've timed it going slow. It's 40 seconds. No excuses. Everybody can do that. 40 seconds at the most. You say the three Hail Marys when you wake up and say when you go to bed. Just roll out of bed. Say them right then. Before you go to bed, say them right then. Okay? Holiness and purity for our state and life. And say the rosary every day. Our Lady wasn't bored in heaven going, I wonder what they're doing in Portugal today when she came down to Fatima. If she came down and told us to say the rosary every day, who are we to ignore that? So that's the prayers every day. Three Hail Marys and a rosary. We also have to practice mortification. We want to do three to five small mortifications every day. Now this is pretty easy. We've talked about this before. When you're taking a shower, at the end, turn it on cold for one or two, three glory bees. In the summer, that's not much of a mortification but you get the idea. Drive around with the, with the car, not exactly the temperature you like. So a little too warm in the summer, a little too cold in the winter. Nothing that's going to make you sick, but something like that. Practice custody of the eyes. We're walking by an interesting display in the store. We make ourselves look away. We're in a really cool part in the book. We set it down. We get a letter we really want to read. Say, well, I'll, I'll look at that in 10 minutes, okay? Put a smooth pebble or a bean in one shoe one day, the other shoe the other day. It's there to annoy you. That's the object. At every meal, season up one piece of food in a way that you don't like. 
and eat it anyway. Take more of what, more of what you don't like, less of what you do like. Cut back or eliminate sweets. If you find yourself at a restaurant, find what you really want to order, order something else. All these things are ways of getting control of your will so you can say no to pleasure. If you can say no to legitimate pleasure, you can say no to illegitimate pleasure because your will doesn't distinguish. Your intellect does, but not your will. You've got reins on it. And then stay busy. The fathers of the church teach that for every one devil that tempts a busy man, there are a legion that tempt an idle man. Just stay busy with useful work, useful thoughts, useful reading. Lounging around is just asking for a, an attack from hell. That's all it's doing. What do we do then if a temptation suddenly strikes us? Two things. We have to move our minds and we have to move our bodies. How do we move our minds? First thing, we're getting tempted. Precious blood wash over me because get, that gets the devil out. Precious blood wash over me. Then we want heaven in, so we say, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, St. Maria, Grady, Guardian Angel, help me. So precious blood, wash over me, devil out. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, St. Maria, Grady, Guardian Angel, help me. That gets heaven in. So we've moved our minds. That's the first part. The last thing is since we're being moved towards something pleasurable that we don't want to think about, we just derail it by thinking about something wonderful that's pleasurable that doesn't have any sin with it, so that would be canoeing in Montana, because what could be better than that? So you just, you just think about that, and you'll remember it. So you go, oh, I've got to think about this. And you have a good, because if you try to fight it straight on, that's not the way to do it. You just derail towards something pleasurable that's totally legitimate. So, precious blood wash over me. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, St. Maria, great guardian angel, help me. Think about Canada, in Montana. And then you move. To move your body, you move. Get up, you know, take a step, whatever. You just move. It's like a spiritual martial arts move or a wrestling move. So we move our mind and move our body. Again, real quick on the mind. Precious but wash over me. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, St. Marie, Great Guard, Angel, help me. Think about Canona, Montana, and then we move. If it isn't over right then, then we just keep asking Our Lady to help us. As long as we're fighting, we're not sinning. As long as we're fighting, we're not sinning. That's really, don't get discouraged. It may be a battle, but as long as you're fighting, you're not sinning. If you're calling on Our Lady, it doesn't matter how bad you think it is. You just keep calling her. You are not sinning. Okay. Now, there, it might be hard to remember, but surprisingly enough, there's a little piece of paper with all this on it, and there's hundreds of them right out there, and so everybody should take one of these when you go. Don't miss them. They're on the table. So, again, we have one thing with filters, another on how to, how to, how to fight temptations and remain pure when we're living in a brothel, which is where we all live. Okay. We started by talking about psychological warfare. Let's close with a thought on the spiritual aspects of this warfare. We'll take a couple ideas from St. Alphonsus. He's the great doctor of moral theology of the church. St. Alphonsus, quote, In other vices, the devil fishes with a hook. In this, he fishes with a net so that by impurity he gains more for hell than by all other sins. God has inflicted the severest chastisement on the world, sending down deluges of water and fire from heaven in punishment for the sin of impurity. Since sins against purity are the most frequent and most abundant confessional matters, and on account of which the greater number of souls fall into hell. Indeed, I do not hesitate to assert that all those who are damned are damned on account of this one vice of impurity, or at least not without it. That's St. Alphonsus. Let us be very careful to make and preserve that covenant with our eyes.